<clears throat> Hello, uh, today is the, the 2nd of May 2023, and uh, I, I chose to, to talk about um, uh, Berlin architecture, and the reason I, I do so is because on, on May 2nd, 1945, uh, um, apparently, uh, the, you know, the, the Russian, uh, the, the Soviet army um, was able to, uh, you know, conquer uh, Berlin. And uh, there is a famous photograph uh, that was taken on May 2nd uh, in Berlin uh, on the Reichstag, where two Russian soldiers uh, planted uh, the, you know, the Soviet uh, uh, banner right there at the top of the Reichstag. So by the way of this event that, you know, in, on May 2nd, 1945, essentially that's when the war was lost. Berlin fell and, uh, and uh, do you know what followed. So by the way of this, I thought of talking about Berlin architecture and there is much to say. So let's begin. Um, Berlin had a turbulent uh, history, but Berlin is a, is a city that is very uh, sophisticated and cosmopolitan and very open to an architecture that is not always produced by architects from Berlin. Like for example, John Haydock, uh, one of the New York Five, uh, the you know, celebrated group of five architects, the other four being uh, um, Peter Eisenman, uh, Richard Meyer, Charles Guidney and Michael Graves. Well, John Haydock was invited to, to build a few things in Berlin and so was his darling, his uh, protege, Daniel Lipskind. But let's begin, I mean, I begin uh, in a way capriciously, but you know, I had to begin in a certain way. So I begin with John Haydock, an American architect of Czech origin, uh, the building in Berlin. The Kreuzberg, Kreuzberg Tower, uh, actually all these three buildings that you see were destined for demolition. And it was the community of the architects, both from Germany, Berlin, and outside of Germany and Berlin, who protested and they were able to save them. They are peculiar buildings. They are idiosyncratic buildings. Uh, I mean, look at this lower, uh, you know, height uh, building, you know. It's known that, uh, you know, the sloping roof is usually done the other way, not with a, you know, with a lower uh, uh, part in the center of the building. It's almost like a mask, like a face, almost like, a, like the face of a cat. And in fact, I think I, I will show here a cartoon that appeared in, in the media in, in Germany, I think in Germany, uh, where, where this aspect of this particular facade was, uh, uh, you know, uh, expressed uh, in a cartoonish way. Uh, uh, anyway, I hope I, I will see it later. This John Haydock was a strange man. He was considered by many, by some, no, I should not exaggerate, by some, the most important architect at the end of the 20th century. I, I, I don't uh, subscribe to this, but there, are, there were some important North American critics who thought so, but he was a remarkable educator. He ran uh, Cooper Union in New York, a very special architecture school, and at that time, Daniel Lipskind was a student there, Elizabeth Diller. There were important professors like uh, Peter Eisenman, uh, Ricardo Scofidio, and others. Now let's see, let's see what he built. First, he built this. He, he built something else, and we are going to see that something else also. This is a, an architecture that uh, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, in, in, in entice me a lot. But, but it, is, it is original and it is, uh, in its peculiar way, intriguing. Uh, if I have an objection, is that this architecture, uh, if you don't see the, the landscape or the, the environment, uh, seems almost like a, a model. 
you know, the model of a building and not the building itself. That's because of the, of the nature of, uh, I mean, his conception about architecture, John Haydock. He has beautiful architecture books with his drawings. He drew incessantly and he drew very, very well, very poetically. He, poetically, he made beautiful, exquisite architecture books with his own works. And I recommend them to you. Unfortunately, the, the, the prices are very high sometimes. Um, anyway, an, an interesting man, John Haydock even if not particularly because of his built work. This is my opinion. So these three buildings with a tower in the center and uh, the lower buildings left and right are by John, by John Haydock in Berlin and not far away from it is the uh, Jewish Museum by uh, Daniel Lipskin, his student. This is also by John Haydock, a house for two brothers, a, a, a strange house itself. I mean, we see again here duality and the rift between the two buildings, the two, it's one building, but, but you see the schism, the rift. And uh, I, I hope I have the plan here. It's a very neurotical plan. It's probably the, the plan with the most the, the biggest number of doors, considering its surface, <clears throat> which is like a square. I'm afraid I might not have the plan here, but if you remember the name of the, of the building, a house for two brothers, you can check on Google images, just type in plan and you will see the plan. Also by John Haydar. Ah, here is the plan. Now, was I mistaken when I said, I mean, look how many doors are here and the sp spaces are very tight. And it's, 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 I don't know, in a way it's a maddening plan. It's perfectly symmet symmetrical. <clears throat> it's, um, the, you know, uh, within a square that, you know, there are these uh, four apartments, but it's, I don't know. I mean, when I when I look at this drawing, I, I feel like I'm losing my mind. It's 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 of those doors, you know. It's it's something sick here. If you allow me to to be so uh, uh, you know irreverential or irreverential, I don't know how to uh, say it correctly. It's not. They are not expensive houses. I mean, you know, being individual houses in Berlin. In a sense, they are expensive, but the, the, the spaces are rather small and very tight, very, <laughs> it's something, uh, it's something uh, here, you know, almost sadistic. Uh, but he is an interesting, he was an interesting man uh, and uh, check his drawings. He, he drew very, very uh, interestingly and uh, he was a master of um, publishing great uh, little or not so little books on architecture. Again, John Haydock in Berlin, the house for two brothers, Berlin mask. I have now uh, also some images from his uh, uh, drone work. Um, I mean, this is not a presentation about John Haydock, but uh, you know, I take the occasion to talk about this man who did build in, in, in Berlin and he didn't build too much otherwise. He built the most, in fact, in Berlin, John Haydock, surrealist, surrealist architecture, the architectural uncanny, Berlin mask, architecture and urbanism. Now we arrive at a very interesting architect born, born in Poland, just like Daniel Lipskind, but as opposed to Daniel Lipskind who went to the United States and later on he returned to Berlin, to Germany, uh, Tzvi Hecker went to Israel and he built in Berlin a school that is uh, uh, very interesting, particularly seen from above and in his drawings. Uh, it's this, this uh, school, it's a Jewish school, Heinz Kalinski Schule in, in Berlin. And look at it. 
This is the school that Tzvi Hacker built. And by the way of Tzvi Hacker, with whom I had uh, the honor, I could say, to be in an exhibition in New York at one point, Tzvi Hacker said something very amusing, but also alarming. He said, great art and great architecture must be illegal. And I, I like what he says, it's true. It's true because, because great artists and great architects love to break rules. It's almost a definition. I don't know of any great architect who, who was not a rules breaker. This is why, my dear friends, if I am to sound demagogical and thus unconvincing, but I do consider you my friends and I hope we are friends, please, please, please break the rules. Break the rules because that's when you have a certain level of satisfaction. Of course, you'll pay the price for breaking the rules, but at least you know that you did something from the heart. You did something that you felt like doing. Don't respect all those, you know, normatives and rules and regulations and all that hell, bureaucratic hell. You know, be yourselves. I remember what Sayark. Uh, very important architecture school in Los Angeles uh, had as, as one of its mottos uh, to hell with regulations. We are going for the unknown. Yes, we are going for the unknown. And Tzvi Hacker said the same thing. And look at the school he built. This is built, it's not just drawn, and it's in Berlin. Unfortunately, it's not so interesting at the level of the eye, because he worked predominantly, I would say, with a plan, and maybe because of who knows, I'm sure he, he had to fight with bureaucracy in Germany as well. But he built the, the, the school um, in good measure as he envisioned it. You see, from the level of, of, of the eye, uh, you know, uh, the building is not so uh, agitated and agitating as it is from the top, as is seen from the top. Here is the architect, Tzvi Hacker. I admire him, a uh, very interesting architect, and he, he built in Israel some very interesting buildings and very provocative. And uh, here are some uh, drawings done, some graphics done for the study, you know, studying uh, for, uh, for the school. You see, what I, what I uh, quoted uh, a little bit uh, with different words, but the same meaning. Good architecture cannot be legal. It is illegal. Well, th there are variations of this statement. I read it also, but the meaning is the same. And if you allow me, dear students, do illegal projects. Don't do legal projects. In other words, don't let the lawyer or the bureaucrat or the who knows who to tell you what to do. Do something, you know, with your passion, with your love. When you are in love, you, you don't listen to reason, to advices from so-called, uh, you know, good uh, advisors. No, you do things from the heart. Do things from the heart. And if it happens to be legal, it's fine. But if it happens to be illegal, that's fine too. Tzvi Hacker. I mean, even one Astanescu, born in Reshica and arriving now and more and more, they talk about her in Romania. She's an architect, but she left Timisoara where she studied before she finished her studies. I don't know. She worked for M. Kolhas, she worked for the, uh, Herzog and de Moron, she worked for uh, Kazuyo Sejima. So she worked for three Pritzker Prize laureates, and now herself is, uh, <clears throat> you know, quite appreciated. She teaches at Harvard, and she herself said very clearly, breaking the rules is, uh, is, is appealing. And I would say it is. Yes, it is. So break the rules. The, the, the cosmos, the universe, will not fall apart if you break the rules. Believe me, it will not. But you will feel better. 
even if I know you'll probably punished with a you'll be punished with a bad grade and uh, you know bad uh, you know reviews and so on. But be yourselves is very very important. So we are still looking at this school that uh, Zvi Hacker built in uh, Berlin. Now Daniel Lipskin, the darling, the protege of uh, John Haydock, uh, the Jewish Museum, which I'm sure you know. And here we have the, you know, the zigzagging of his plan. And uh, we see here the, the, the old building. He also did the roofing of this uh, courtyard. But this is the Jewish museum that he built, covered in zinc. And, uh, you know, uh, he, he betrayed rules too. You know, he broke the rules. And he's very appreciated. So you have to choose in your life as an architect between being, uh, you know, submissive and, uh, you know, uh, uh, tamed and uh, provoking no discomfort in anyone but you also don't express yourself and you become less motivated and you have less and less pleasure to do work and the other choice is to uh, to just express yourself with who you are and uh, yes uh, attempting to improve yourself but at the same time not renouncing to your true uh, you know, your feelings, your thoughts, your round thoughts and your round feelings. And I think that if you choose the second path, although it's not in any way an easy path, I'm aware of it, it's a difficult path, but it's better than the first one. Don't compromise too much. Please don't. You lose the appetite for doing architecture. Architecture should be an adventure. And if it's not an adventure, slowly you become, uh, you know, uh, apathetic, uh, uninterested because there is no passion. And these people who build in this way, they had passion. I mean, you imagine when he proposed this building, I don't know, it has 1,000 or 11,000 different windows. This, this building, just this building. But, you know, uh, he made a name for himself and uh, he now even has his office in Berlin, uh, Daniel Lipskin. I don't know if you know, but in this building, there is a courtyard that is named with the name of a great Romanian poet, Paul Celan, Paul Celan. Uh, well, uh, I learned about him rather late in life, but uh, uh, check him out. If you love poetry, Paul Celan arrived in some assessment in the proximity of, of Goethe and Hölderlin, which is an immense honor. And he died at 50 by committing suicide, throwing himself from a bridge in Paris on, uh, on the river, in the Seine. Anyway, yes, a courtyard is named Paul Salon in this museum by Daniel Lipskin. And why? Because uh, Salon, uh, well, one of the reasons he lost all his family in the concentration camps uh, in the Second World War, but also his poetry is very charged with that sadness, with that, you know, uh, uh, heaviness that uh, death and thinking about death. Uh, uh, you know, is is, uh, uh, is notoriously <laughs> capable of that 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 heaviness. But in his case, the bio, bio, biography of Paul Celan or Paul Celan, if we are to read in Romanian, although he changed his name, I think in France, although he wrote in German. This was interesting. He wrote in the language of the oppressors those who killed his family. Although he, he could have uh, written poetry in French because he lived in France or in Romanian because he knew Romanian. 
Anyway, an interesting building by, uh, by uh, Daniel Lipskind. And now I'm absolutely sure that many so-called well-intentioned professors would protest against these windows. They would say, what's the logic of these windows? How do you uh, legitimize them? How do you uh, sustain them? Well, there is, you know, in architecture, there is also ex expression. Expression and certain decisions have to do with, even with the capriciousness of the artist or the architect. Not everything has to be tamed and, uh, you know, uh, uh, explainable in a rational way. No. Uh, here he is uh, uh, during the construction. Uh, again and again, great architects do not follow prescriptions. And I think we can learn from them to free ourselves from the heaviness of uh, impositions, uh, you know, inhibitions, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, recommendations based on uh, bureaucratic uh, concerns and all the rest. Do not forget, architecture at one point was the queen of the arts. Architecture was the queen of the arts. Do not forget this. This is also done by him uh, within the, he covered the courtyard of the old building that is connected to the new one that he built. The memory void. This is uh, the courtyard uh, of this museum. But I, I, there are two, I'm not sure this is the one called Paul Salon. Maybe it is, although I think it is not. Uh, there are, the, you know, these two spaces. Well, this one and this one. Although maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know. I actually didn't visit this museum. I am strange to. I did go inside. I mean, I I I was here, but I let the students explore the building inside. I never entered it. But I know that one. Maybe this courtyard is called Paul Sel Paul Salon. Paul Salon. Paul Celan. This is the one actually, the Paul Salon court. Yeah, it was a different, this is the one named with the name of this truly great uh, poet, Paul Celan, Paul Salon. There are some echoes of this, and I, I didn't check when uh, the Gualada Cemetery near Barcelona by uh, Eric Miraes and uh, uh, Carmen Pinos was built, but I see some resemblances here in the, in, the, in, the, in the psychological and aesthetical expression of what death means. In that cemetery, truly a great work by Eric Miraes and, um, and uh, Carmen Pinos, and uh, this uh, courtyard in the Jewish Museum by Daniel Lipskin. So this is the one that is called the Paul Celan or Paul Salon. Take risks, dear students, take risks. If you don't take risks, somebody said, if you take risks, you might lose. But if you don't take risks, you lose for sure. So it's better to take risks. Frank Gehry, even Frank Gehry built in, uh, in Berlin and he even proposed other things that were not yet built. But DZ Bank is a good work, I think, by uh, Frank Gehry, and is right across the street from the um, Holocaust Memorial by um, uh, Peter Eisenman. We are talking about two deconstructivists, although they might have objected to the name deconstructivist, but they were both part of the exhibition Deconstructivist Architecture, Deconstructivism, at the Museum of Modern Art in the early 90s. Now, look at what Frank Gehry built. You know, again and again, the tamed architect, the timid professor 
would protest against this, would say, what is this nonsense? Where did you see something like this? But Frangieri doesn't care and he builds. So choose your mentors. Uh, his almost obsession with the fish. Maybe you know, Frank Gehry was uh, always uh, very, very affectionate towards the fish. The fish is very present in some of his works. Sometimes, in, 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 like in the case in Barcelona, literally so, explicitly so. He proposed also this tower, which was not built, as far as I know. But he made this proposal for a tower in Berlin. Back to the DZ bank. Towards the street is a little bit tamed compared to other buildings by Frank Gehry. But I actually like this, that is more, a little bit more reticent. But, but inside is a different story. In the end, uh, Frank Gehry didn't allow too much uh, reticence to take over him. And this is, uh, as I said, just across the street from the Holocaust uh, uh, Memorial by uh, Peter Eisenman. Now, why do these architects build in this way? And why do they uh, intrigue us, not to say stir us up or um, agitate us? Because they express emotions. They say something beyond the so-called uh, functionalism of functions. But that's, that's what architecture is. If architecture remains at the level of, you know, uh, 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 mathematically or mechanically or correctly resolving so-called functions is not yet architecture. That's not architecture. There's just, uh, you know, a correct uh, manipulation of some requirements, but that's not yet architecture. Here in the foreground, we see the Holocaust uh, Memorial by uh, Peter Eisenman. And here we arrive at Peter Eisenman. A man whose name means it would translate from German, the Iron Man. But for a certain period in his life, he advocated weak architecture, the Iron Man, the Holocaust Memorial. Here it is, is a very, it was a very published work and considered very, very highly. Uh, I think he did a good job here, uh, uh, Peter Eisenman. Amazing in this case also is Berlin, but the guilt of Berlin, the guilt of Germany allowed for such a work to be, you know, uh, built, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the center of the capital of, uh, of, uh, of Germany. It's, a, it's like a cemetery, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 initially was based on some kind of a greed and then he began to distort it, to deform it. And, um, you know, this is, this is the result. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a reminder of, the, of, of something which unfortunately Vladimir Putin refuses to acknowledge. The, the, the horrible realities of war, the, the, the unspeakable, you know, uh, tragedy that the war is. And how do you explain it that in 1945, two Russian soldiers planted after incredible, uh, uh, you know, suffering during the war, they, they survived and they planted that flag on top of the Reichstag. And now they provoke a deadly war in Ukraine. Rem Kolhas was right, human beings do not learn. It seems we cannot learn. I mean, was it enough? Wasn't it enough, the Second World War? Why did we have to have the war in Iraq? Why, do you have to, why do, did we have to have the war in Afghanistan? Why do we need to have the war in Ukraine? Russia has the largest territory on earth. No country is bigger than Russia. And they want it even more. 
land. Why? The trees, the vegetation is beginning to pop up, you know, so I, I welcome the vegetation, you know, it's like life is asserting herself in the spring and after the spring and, uh, you know, the green blocks, you know, uh, turn heavy as they are, they are, um, uh, they are uh, softened in a way by, by the generosity of the trees, of the green. And also by the playfulness of some young people who are not so young, who jump. They are not supposed to do this, but as you can see, people love to break rules. That's the rule. People love to break rules. Unfortunately, students in architecture, in some schools of architecture, are afraid to break rules. So here we see the building by uh, uh, Frank Gehry, and here is the Holocaust Memorial by uh, Peter Eisenman. It has an underground part too, because it is a memorial, and you know there are there is also a narrative. It's, it's some kind of a Cartesian sunflower, if I. To call it so. Interesting work by Peter Eisenman, Memorial for Murder, Jews in Berlin. Now the Checkpoint Czech, Charlie Museum, which is also by Peter Eisenman and is right across the street from a building by Rem Kolhas. This is not, in my opinion, a great achievement by Peter Eisenman. Uh, such buildings we can see almost like this in, um, in, in Bucharest as well, you know, either a hospital or a school. Uh, anyway. Peter Eisenman, Checkpoint Charlie, Berlin. But this work could have been I would say almost astonishing, although probably frightening for some people. Unfortunately, it was not built a tower for uh, the um, uh, Reinhardt Tower for uh, having the name of an important uh, theater and film director, Max Reinhardt, but it was not built, but it was proposed for, for Berlin by Peter Eisenman. Uh, look at this, you know, the, the, this section. I think this would have been one of the best buildings by Peter Eisenman, but again, unfortunately, it was not built. Himself a rules breaker. You have to, you know, Tzvi Hacker was right. A great building has to be illegal. You know, you break the rule somewhere and Otherwise, you know, you, you, you don't uh, really stand out. I'm sorry it was not built. It would have been great if it was. Now, another important architect, a Frenchman this time, Jean Nouvel, Galerie Lafayette. Here it is. It's a mall. But Gallery Lafayette, Jean Nouvel, and there are two inverted, uh, well, an inverted pyramid and another pyramid above. Uh, I hope I have a section here to show. Uh, maybe this um, architectural black hole, if I can call it so, could symbolize maybe a certain uh, question mark that Jean Nouvel had vis a vis what a mall is. I don't know why he did it so. It's a large building. You know, Frederick Strasse. Uh, here you see the two pyramids, one pointing upwards, one pointing downwards. This theme also appears at the Louvre by IMP in Paris. Jean Nouvel, you see his, uh, you know, uh, portrait there. Norman Foster, the Reichstag right above the, the Reichstag. And because I mentioned I am paying with the, his glass pyramid in Paris, personally, I think 
but this is my maybe idiosyncratic uh, uh, you know uh, thinking that a pyramid should not be transparent and that a dome should not be transparent but foster still did a good job here i'm not sure again about the the, the choice of the materials but i understand this was a reaction to what the reichstag was and wanted to bring the feeling that the reichstag now belonged to the people to all the people so they climbed on top of the building and the building belonged to them and uh, you know in, in this way accepting that democracy won but somehow that glass dome in my opinion doesn't sit perfectly on top of this maybe polemically in a way but it doesn't have enough force in my opinion anyway this is the reichstag and that's the dome the glass dome built by norman foster sir norman foster the spiral uh, saves a little bit uh, you know the feeling that the glass could be a little bit problematical because the spiral means process and is dynamic and, <clears throat> and so on norman foster reichstag dome berlin has indeed uh, you know a very rich uh, uh, you know, uh, very rich, uh, how to say, samples of, of, of uh, important architecture. Uh, Richard Rogers, the Daimler Chrysler building, another Pritzker Price laureate. So Foster, we saw Jean Nouvel Pritzker, we saw Norman Foster Pritzker, we see Sir Richard Rogers Pritzker. You know, uh, they are one after the other. Potsdamer Platz. I like uh, Sir Richard Rogers. I mean, I'm not a very techno man, but um, there is some vigor, some genuine vigor in, in his handling of high tech. So he did all these buildings. Well, you know, the, the money was there. Mercedes, no, Daimler, Chrysler, Renzo Piano, another um, the Prisker uh, winner. He built and he worked, as you know, together with Sir Richard Rogers when they won the competition for uh, uh, Centre Georges Pompidou in uh, in Paris. A skyscraper on Potsdamer Platz Square and the Daimler Financial Services, Potsdamer Platz, they were built by Renzo Piano. He collaborated with a German architect and unfortunately I don't, I don't know his name. I think these buildings are better than some other buildings by Renzo Piano and maybe the collaboration with the German architect and also the fact that they used the ceramic tile, you know, this beige, uh, uh, material is a ceramic tile and, and this brings uh, something to the buildings that I, 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 I liked. This was also built by um, uh, Renzo Piano. Again and again, Renzo Piano, uh, Richard Rogers, they themselves as young architects took risks. When they participated in the competition for Centre Georges Pompidou, Centre Beaubourg, they were sure that they were not going to win because they were young and, uh, you know, uh, they thought that they had no chance of winning. So they did something very eccentric, very extravagant, because they were sure they were not going to win. And they won. And that was enough to launch them in an incredible career in architecture. 
both of them. They also had a chance to collaborate with a great uh, engineer who unfortunately died young, uh, who helped them, Peter Rice. Yeah, again, um, Renzo Piano. Bosamer Platz. Now here we see this was also in the on the right. I'm not sure, but I'm almost sure it's also by Renzo Piano, the building on the right. Miss Van der Rohe, he couldn't miss the boat. You know, uh, the, new, uh, the new uh, National Gallery uh, is, a, is an important building by Miss. It's hard to confound it. It's, 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 it's a Miss building. And it was recently, you know, uh, refurbished or, uh, uh, yeah, by Chipperfield. Uh, anyway, the columns or the sculptures are not his. The building is an older picture, Miss Van der Rohe. Maybe you know that Miss Van der Rohe, his name is not the name of his father. In fact, the name of his father is Miss, which he took like almost the first name. And the Roe is the name of his mother. And uh, maybe you know that uh, Miss wanted his name to sound like uh, the name of a nobleman. And he wanted to have it, you know, um, uh, Miss van Roe. But in Germany, this was not allowed, so he, uh, borrow the Dutch form. So that's how his name became Miss van der Rohe, uh, which in translation is uh, also a little bit funny uh, because Miss means a loser. Um, and uh, I don't know, there are, it, it's a strange name in a way. You know, he wanted to sound like a nobleman and his, his father was a, um, you know, um, a stonemason. He was a uh, kind of a humble origins, but he wanted to sound uh, like a nobleman. And then he sabotaged himself by using the first name as Miss, which means, as I said, uh, loser. Strange, uh, strange. Maybe a little essay can be written about the, you know, like a psychoanalytical interpretation of the changing of the name of Miss van der Rohe. But the building is good. And it's even better when there are such sculptures inside because you have the tension between the, you know, the classical, if we have to call them so, sculptures and the modernistic building. This is a project by Miss van der Rohe for Berlin, which was never built, but it's a, it's a great rendering, of course, manually done. So the skyscraper was proposed by Miss Van der Rohe, but it never, it was never built. Um, look at the plan. You wouldn't expect this from Miss Van der Rohe, would you? But at that time he was an expressionist architect. I mean, there is expressionism here in the plan and uh, in the silhouette of the building. James Sterling, another important architect, this time from Great Britain, um, the British Embassy in Berlin. Here it is. Sorry about the Alami, uh, you know, uh, trying to kill their own work, meaning the photograph, by spreading their name everywhere. I hate when this happens. But this is the building by James Sterling. This is another building also by James Sterling uh, after he began to work with Michael Wilford and uh, Leon Creer and there are here influences from postmodernism which weakened him because he was a, a remarkable modernist architect. Aldo Rossi. Aldo Rossi, by the way, tomorrow we will be either the birthday or the day when Aldo Rossi died. So tomorrow, if you have a little bit of time and interest, I will present in detail the works of Aldo Rossi, a very important architect, Italian architect, who unfortunately died in a car accident. He could have lived longer. 
he built this all this complex of uh, you know housing uh, housing complex apartment buildings in berlin aldo rossi because berlin had the, <clears throat> had the, the 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 great idea to invite three times in a century the most important or some of the most important architects in the world to build in berlin housing or houses even the corbusier built a united habitation and i hope i have it in this presentation they did it in the 1930s in the 1950s and in the 1980s this project is from 1980s this is also by by uh, aldo rossi unafraid to use color as you can see and I know in some schools of architecture, color is prohibited. It has to everything has to be gray, right? Why does everything have to be gray? Why? I mean, color is life. I mean, how many white things, perfectly white things, are in nature? Very rarely, if at all. Everything is color. I mean, look outside through the window. So why do we make gray projects? Not great, but gray. Aldo Rossi. So all these, uh, all these buildings, uh, you know, that we see at the bottom of the picture were built by Aldo Rossi in Berlin. Here he is with uh, his building uh, behind. But you can see Berlin had a very open mind and uh, architects were allowed to build uh, according to their own uh, whims almost, you know, Aldo Rossi, the octagon, the octagon which uh, was loved, adored by Leonardo da Vinci, almost all the, the architectural sketches that the great Renaissance man, Leonardo da Vinci, did were done based using the octagon and here we see a courtyard with an octagonal uh, shape uh, in, in in the work of uh, Aldo Rossi color uh, you see the octagonal uh, courtyard in the plant sorry about the low resolution but you have an idea about uh, you know how the how the building uh, looks like in plant I rush a little bit because we, we still have a lot of pictures. I told you I have more than 400 pictures in this presentation. We see again Aldo Rossi being totally uninhibited and uninhibiting in terms of chromatics, in terms of color. Good for him. And the very lyrical drawings of this architect who drew incessantly Karl Friedrich Schinkel, the great 19th century German architect. This building is in Berlin. Uh, I mean, truly, this city has uh, quite a collection of great buildings, one after the other. And I don't show all of them. It would, it would, it would if I, I mean, you know, it would take a few days to, to go through all the worthy buildings that this city built and imagine how much was destroyed during the second world war inside post reunification I, unfortunately i don't know german and i'm ashamed but i don't showing the catholic Kölwitz, the great uh, german artist sculpture mother with her dead son this 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 artwork should be multiplied and sent to the kremlin and the oculus, which exposes it to the elements, here it is. Catacolbits, and it's open here, just in, like in the Pantheon in Rome. So the rain and the snow, well, there isn't so, too much snow lately, thanks to the climate um, the warming. Uh, 
but um, the the sculpture is is very moving mother with a dead son i th i think i heard correctly today on the radio that until now about or more than 200,000 russian soldiers died in the war in ukraine and the war continues it is incredible I wonder if if this this very photograph was 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 attached to the wall right in front of Vladimir Putin, if if he would reflect on it, and if he would decide that the war is truly a great 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 tragedy. And I'm afraid, no, he won't change his mind. He will send other two hundred thousand Russian soldiers to death not to speak about the dead Ukrainians and the destroyed mothers and wives and sisters and girlfriends. The blindness of, of and the foolishness of humankind is without limits. Here it is, Kate Kulvitz mother with a dead son why is vladimir putin not here on zoom to look at this carl friedrich schinkel this building is also by him and they're inside the the previous building uh, that that we looked at um, during the Nazi times, you know, they also used the building for their own rituals. Soldiers, militaries trying to impose order, a restrictive, punitive order on life and kill it, essentially. Look at them, how triumphant they are or they were, no? How triumphant. And we know very well what happened within the Second World War. Altes Museum, Berlin, 1930, uh, quintessential building in Berlin, also built by Karl Friedrich Schinkel, a great building inspired by, uh, you know, Greek uh, antiquity. The rendering of Karl Friedrich Schinkel And the plan is, uh, you know, particularly I mean, the, the round part is, um, you know, uh, crafted, uh, so to speak, uh, using as a model the Pantheon in Rome. I hope I have an, uh, an image of it. Yes, here, and I hope I can see, well, I guess a little bit here. Anyway. It's less, uh, less, um, maybe less moving than the, the Pantheon in Rome, but it's still a great building, I think, this museum by, by Schinkel. And the rendering done by him and the great columns. Um, the Altes, Altes Museum, Museum uh, in, in, in Berlin. Carl Friedrich Schinkel. That work was um, something else with the intervention of um, David Chipperfield. Uh, so this is a section through, through the, uh, the Altes Museum by uh, Schinkel. And you see clearly in, in the section, uh, you know, the, the influence from the Pantheon. Bruno Taut, another very important German architect and uh, he did some housing projects quite interesting this is one of them 
they built in the 30s is most famous uh, of course with that uh, glass pavilion that was built in Köln uh, the world exhibition in 1914 but unfortunately it was demolished because another war deadly war started then the first world war in 1914 and the great although small in, the, in terms of dimensions but great glass pavilion by Bruno Taut was demolished Some uh, entrance the door, you know, doorways into the building by uh, Bruno Taut, you see again the presence of color. And this is another, the horseshoe estate. He built this, you see, it is in the shape of a horseshoe. Bruno Taut again. I don't know if he built the other buildings around it, but he built the horseshoe. And, you know, doorways, you know, entrances into, into the large building. Uh, you see each one is different and each one has uh, some color. And, uh, you know, in itself, they are creations. Bruno Taut, a very important architect who also wrote very passionately and uh, I particularly recommend to you uh, an outburst against concept. Yes, this beloved word by architects and students of architecture is uh, ridiculed by Bruno Taut and I think I understand why. The word concept deserves some uh, critical attention because all architects, including myself, sometimes, although I'm critical towards it, somehow it seems we cannot avoid it. The concept was, the concept is, and we are so sure of ourselves when we use the word concept. But the truth is, the concept by itself is dry, and it's pretentiously dry. The heart doesn't work with concepts. The brain does, but not the heart. So we should reflect about this. Why are we so fond of the brain? Why are we so fond of so-called concepts? Maybe the word concept uh, came via Michelangelo, who said that uh, pittura è una cosa mentale. The painting is a mental thing because he tried to say that painting is not just the illustration of reality, it's, it's, it's also a mental construct. But in architecture, the word concept, as far as I know, the greatest architects didn't use the word concept at all. I never met this word in Frank Lloyd Wright, in what I read, or Le Corbusier, not even Miss, not Kant, they don't use the word concept. And I wonder why. Let's ask ourselves why. Why don't they use this word? And why did Bruno Taut, the German architect who built this horseshoe building, uh, uh, ridicule this term? And if you want to uh, see the proof, I can send to you the link, uh, in fact, the text that he wrote. Uh, he wrote uh, violently against the concept actually against the world who knows maybe he used it himself too what is funny even of course ram kolhas uses the word uh, concept but even tina turner the great uh, dancer and musician uses the word concept i've heard her walter gropius interbau exhibition as i told you berlin invited important architects in the 30s in the 50s and in the 80s this is what Walter Gropius built in Berlin in 1957. This building, an apartment building. It's not bad. Maybe it's not very, very wow, but it's not a bad building. 
1957, Walter Gropius, returning from the United States after the end of the war and build, building in Berlin. We know what he built in Dessau for Bauhaus, the school he founded, but this is in Berlin. And this is also, let's see, it was built between, uh, ah, it's another complex of buildings, another colony of uh, important buildings by important architects in the field of um, housing in the 30s. So it was built, not what Gropius did in the 50s. This is about the other colony built in the 30s, as I said, the first one. It was built between 1929 and 1931 under the overall master plan of German architect Hans Scharun, who also built, uh, and I hope I have it here, a great, uh, uh, another great building in, in Berlin, one of the most important, the Philharmonic, uh, or Philharmonia of Berlin. Seven preeminent Weimar era architects took part, Scharun, Fred Forbat, Otto Barning, Walter Gropius, Paul Rudolf Henning, and Hugo Herrick. The nickname, Ring Siedlung came from the association of these architects with the Ring Collective. The, op the open spaces were designed by the German modernist landscape architect. Um, you read his name. And this is um, uh, Hans Scharun, a building by Hans Scharun. He also did the, the master plan. Uh, sometimes I'm, I'm a little bit confused because um, you know, it's not so easy to identify the buildings. Uh, there is a, a map with a, you know, all the buildings identified by the architects who build them, but sometimes the styles of the architects were not so different from each other. It requires a little bit of uh, familiarization with, uh, with this uh, complex of buildings. Again, built in the 30s, not in the 50s, when uh, the building by Walter Gropius was built. So these are, you know, uh, a little more than 20 years earlier, before the war. Uh, lots of apartment buildings, a lot of uh, social interest in Berlin for building uh, decent uh, apartment buildings for uh, even uh, people, uh, you know, uh, so-called common people. That's a noble, um, a noble activity, you know, not to build just for the privileged, but to build also for those who truly are in need of a, of a decent little house. Hans Sharun and uh, the Philharmonica in, sorry, here is written in Romanian. Romanian, it's one of the most important buildings in Berlin by Hans Scharun, uh, you know, an expressionist architect. And uh, what can we say? It's, it's a building that um, is a distinctive style. If I am to use the word style, I, I very, very often I, 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 I reject this word because it's limitative and it's uh, actually misleading. Uh, both these buildings, and they are part of the same uh, ensemble, uh, are by Hans Scharun. Not far away from uh, other important buildings that we already saw. It's right in the heart of, of Berlin. Here they are. And I think uh, here in the lower left uh, right corner is the Sony building by uh, Helmut Jan. And we had the honor and the pleasure and the surprise to have the engineer who engineered this uh, spectacular canopy here or roofing uh, for the, above the Sony uh, courtyard on Zoom about two years ago, Bruce Danziger who worked with uh, Helmut Jan. But we are now inside the uh, Philharmonica or Philharmonia uh, building by Hans Scharun. Uh, a very musical interior because the spaces are floating. And uh, apparently he did a great job. It's a, it's a, a masterwork. An initial sketch and a building without the people inside a section. 
the plan, as you can see, unafraid to 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 uh, you know uh, be uh, you know free free of the greed. A truly very important architect, Hans Sharon. Le Corbusier, I told you, he built a, a unité d'habitation, to use the French naming. The first one was built in Marseille, in France, but uh, he built one in Berlin too. He built only four. Uh, one in Firmini Ver, one I think in Le Havre, the first one in Marseille, and the fourth one in Berlin. I understood it was a little bit modified by the rules and regulations in Germany, but it's still a building by um, Le Corbusier, and I uh, I had a chance to enter it actually with some students who asked the lady, a very kind lady, to allow us to take a look at the uh, one of the you know the, the units inside the building. Even Oscar Niemeyer built in Berlin. I hope I have his building here. It was also built in the 50s when this building by Le Corbusier was built. So here is a view of the interior of one, one apartment, you know, duplex. On the corridor, uh, you know, with the entrances into these um, the units, there was a place even for, uh, you know, the, 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 the people who brought milk to the, the inhabitants of the building to leave the glasses with milk, you know, uh, next to the door that, uh, you know, ordered it, so to speak. Interesting little detail that I found out uh, when I visited the, uh, when, when I visited an, an apartment there. Here it is, the corridor, which is, uh, you know, artificially lit. The street, La Rue, the street, as, uh, as it was called, at least in Marseille, and people are staring at the concrete uh, artistic work. I know there are people who criticize these uh, four um, giant, uh, you know, uh, housing complexes built by Le Corbusier, but uh, the truth is uh, the apartment that I saw didn't look bad at all. It was just fine. It was nothing wrong with it. And now, you know, some visitors enjoying themselves, uh, you know, uh, interacting with the you know, the, the concrete works in this building. Alvaro Siza, another very important architect who built uh, one of his best buildings, in my opinion, Bonjour Tristesse. Um, anyway, uh, here it is. It's, it's a building, yes, which is not exuberant, but uh, reflecting on the history of uh, Berlin, maybe, maybe it's not a bad thing that is not exuberant. But anyway, the, the Berlin has all kinds of architectures. You can see and all kinds of architects who contributed to, uh, you know, uh, with, with their works. And this is the plan of the building by Alvaro Siza. apartment building. 
And you see here the corner, it, it, somebody wrote Bonjour Tristesse. I don't know actually the story about if, 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 if this was intended by the architect, this is the title of a, of a, of a, of a book by uh, Marguerite Ursena, I think, uh, Bonjour Tristesse, which means, uh, you know, hello, uh, sadness. I like this building by Alvaro Cesar with its uh, slightly expressionistic reticence. And I know it's an oxymoron, it's a paradox, but I feel it's appropriate. Bonjour, tristesse. Maybe all of us should whisper at least from time to time these words, bonjour, tristesse. And uh, lyrical drawings of Alvaro Cesar. Rem Kolhas. I'm still not sure I pronounce well his name. I asked a stewardess in a uh, during a trip uh, with a plane, uh, a Dutch stewardess, how to pronounce correctly his name. And I think she said something like Kolhas, not Kulhas, you know, like in English, C O O L, because this is not in English, it's in Dutch, like Kolhas, Rem Kolhas. But you can play with the word that say Rem Kool House, Dutch Embassy, the, the, the Dutch Embassy in Berlin by Rem Kolhas. He built uh, at least two other buildings that I know of. A recent, he recently finished a large uh, building and I, I placed it on the invitation to this uh, uh, presentation today. But this is the embassy, uh, Dutch embassy in, in Berlin, Rem Kolhas. Friedrichstrasse, block designed by architects Oma and Rem Kolhas for the IBA um, Internationale Bau Stelzlung 1987. Again, I, I am unforgivable. I do not know German. But this is the building. It's right across the street from that uh, um, checkpoint Charlie Museum by uh, uh, Peter Eisenman. Uh, this is by uh, Rem Kolhas. Of course, there is a McDonald's there, like uh, the Romanian poet Andrei Codrescu said, we replaced the Berlin Wall, which came down with the Berlin Mall, meaning with consumerism. So we banished communism, but we brought in capitalism, which is obsessed with production, 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 and consumption, consumption, consumption. What does McDonald's have to do here? You know, it's almost like, I mean, it's like, like a provocation, you know. Berlin lost the war, the Second World War. And now, you know, the Americans are building a McDonald's at this, you know, very symbolically, very important place in Berlin, Checkpoint Charlie. Why? Because capitalism is only interested in making money. And there are plenty of tourists there so McDonald had to be present, right? So if we replace the Berlin Wall with the Berlin Mall, and the between wall and mall is a very slight difference because if you take letter M and you turn it upside down, it becomes W and vice versa. Something to think about. We replaced one... Uh, uh, oppressive regime with another oppressive regime because the because communism was obsessed with um, ide ideological oppression while capitalism is obsessed with uh, consumerist oppression i shop therefore i am if you do not shop you do not exist eric mandelson uh, an expressionist architect 
maybe that expression is, is not so obvious in this building, but uh, there are others like this one. Um, an important, very important architect, Eric uh, Mendelssohn. This is on Jerusalemer, uh, Jerusalemer uh, Strasse, uh, most uh, house um, as it is today. And it's not bad. Eric Mendelssohn. Also uh, built uh, the Einstein Tower in Potsdam. Another one of the most important expressionist uh, uh, buildings. Uh, this is also by him, uh, cinema, Eric Mendelssohn. Peter Behrens, another great, great architect, AEG turbine factory, 1908-99. 99, more than 100 years old. So many good architects in Berlin, incredible. So this is uh, again, more than 100 years old. It's an industrial building but it's a famous building in the history of modern architecture. Peter Behrens. Another one uh, by him. This one I didn't see and I regret because I like this building. Also for production, also you know for industry, but but the building has a coherence and is a, is an architectural crystallization that uh, moves beyond what we usually think of an industrial building. An excellent building by Peter Perez. Rob Creer, the brother of Leon Creer. He also was invited in the 19, in, in the 80s, 1980s to build a house, a building, an apartment building. And uh, he also, because he's also a sculptor, uh, as you can see, he did also the sculptures, the statues. And this is the housing complex that he built in Berlin, Rob Creer. His brother didn't build in Berlin, Leon Creer, but he builds, uh, you know, now with the support of the King of uh, Great Britain, former Prince Charles, who they collaborated for many years. And uh, so Leon Creer, uh, uh, the brother of Rob Creer, is, uh, gave up on his uh, initial uh, statement that he is an architect, therefore he doesn't build, he does build. Uh, now and not always in a very inspired way. Uh, look at this beautiful green ivy that climbs on the wall or walls of the of the building by Rob Creer. I I keep telling the students if your facade doesn't turn out well, no problem. Just uh, bring in the ivy. I didn't yet see a building covered partially at least by ivy that doesn't look good. Now. Ivy makes any building looks at least decently or acceptably, at least. Uh, this is the model of that, um, of that uh, building uh, by, by Rob Creer. And uh, again, some strange, uh, but I shouldn't say strange, but anyway, I, I use the word um, uh, sculptures done by him too. Brutalist architecture, we are approaching the end of this presentation. Uh, Berlin has some great brutalist architecture, the Free University, look at this, it's a fortress. It's, it almost looks like a, you know, a building from the heroic uh, Japanese post-war architecture. 
even more, uh, uh, you know, uh, emphatic in its uh, uh, defensive uh, rhetorics. Uh, this is another building which was part of uh, East Berlin. Uh, now it's colored with, uh, maybe it was colored then too, I don't know. I mean, is it brutalist? I think the colors uh, remove actually or soften what the word brutalist might mean. I like it colored, it's vigorous, it's, it's vital, it's, uh, uh, you know, expressive, it's fine. What is not fine is that it used a lot of concrete and concrete pollutes, but at the, the time when it was built, there was no preoccupation with the global warming and pollution and all the rest. Berlin's incredibly cool and impressive brutalist architecture, the title of an article about it, uh, and of a website, here is the website. Uh, Berlin brutalist architecture. The modernist architecture style brutalism is rising in popularity again, and Berlin has a few incredible buildings that still preserve the impressive and incredibly cool era of utopian aesthetics. Let Matthias take you on a tour through Berlin's brutalist heritage. I don't know who Matthias is, but uh, anyway, more images with the brutalist architecture of, uh, of Berlin. A lot of concrete, of course. Some depressively, uh, you know, unkept. The fortress. A good part of these were in East Berlin. Well, <laughs> just around the corner is the embassy of North Korea. And when I, there is a dorm here, which is very inexpensive and quite good for, for uh, students and, and poor uh, professors. And uh, I saw um, some kind of an advertising for a celebratory moment in the launching of a, uh, an atomic bomb, a nuclear experiment made by North Korea. Can you believe it? in Berlin, uh, uh, at the fence, at the entrance door to the, the state of the North Korean uh, embassy, a housing complex, expressionist architecture. We met, we saw already uh, Eric Mendelssohn, but Fritz Höger was even more expressionist than uh, uh, Eric Mendelssohn and this church is, um, I would say, uh, excellent. An excellent example of the expressionism, um, Gothicist expressionism of uh, Fritz Höger, 1930. So almost 100 years ago, uh, here it is. I like this church very much. And the uh, reference, although it's a modernist building, an expressionist building, because expressionism was part of the modernist agenda, but the Gothicist or the Gothic references are appropriate considering that in the Middle Ages, Europe was uh, is at its most convincing to build churches and cathedrals because there was faith, true faith at that time. The uh, little town Chartres rebuilt Chartres Cathedral in 25 years, and it's a masterpiece of Gothic architecture, if not the most sublime cathedral ever built until now. But this is the building of Fritz Höger, and I regret I visited Berlin a few times, but I never came close to this building, and I regret. Here is Fritz Höger, he doesn't look too happy near the model of his uh, church. 
The interior, uh, yes, the Gothic uh, is uh, present for all to see, but I like very much this, uh, this ornamentation, you know, towards the outside and with the insertions of gold, even in the spaces between bricks. It's, it's, it's a refined architecture, um, otherwise massive and very, you know, uh, vigorous and sculptural uh, with its masonry walls. Great handling of brick, this most generous construction material, and look at this, you know, uh, it's almost Byzantine here. No, it's almost Ravenna here. It's, I think it's very beautiful. And look how he, he introduced the golden, uh, you know, touches in between bricks. Could we say it's the gold of spirit? Nice work, Fritz Höger. The interior somehow I don't like so much as the exterior, maybe because of this whiteness and the, I, it's richer somehow outside than inside. But a name to be remembered and to be noticed, Fritz Höger, truly a very important expressionist architect. This is another building by Fritz Höger, a secular building. Fritz Höger Paradise Backyard, that's the building. And you see, it's a very old picture. You, you look, you see that car, the, those cars uh, are, uh, uh, you know, obviously before the war, maybe even before the First World War. But the building is still, uh, you know, it's, in a way, it's still fresh. It's still, if this was built today, I don't think we would protest. Hans Pelzig, another great German architect, Babylon Cinema, 1929, almost 100 years ago. Hans Pelzig also did great uh, uh, stage design. Um, and he uh, has buildings uh, that, that would make uh, any architect uh, almost envious because um, this man uh, lived for architecture very intensely and passionately. This building, unfortunately, does not exist any longer. It existed before his intervention, the Schauspielhaus, and it was remarkable, built for uh, Max Reinhardt. Um, it's, the interior is amazing, was amazing, because it was demolished. It, it survived the Second World War, but it was demolished afterwards. Towards the outside, it's in the building, I think it was kind of like this before the intervention of Hans Pelzig. But look at the interior. And if I read correctly, or if I remember correctly, there was a lot of redness here, that the whole interior was red. And uh, understood it was uh, also kind of a democratic, almost communistic uh, theater that the proletarians were invited uh, in the audience. But the interior is uh, phantasmagoric, is, uh, is, uh, is, is out of this world, you know, with these stalactites and stalagmites. I didn't quite, I don't, I have to think a little bit about if it's a stalactite or a stalagmite. Is I have this problem as though with chicken and kitchen. I always confound them. You know, I, I, I cook the, 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 the kitchen in the chicken. Of course, it's the other way around, but I have to think about it. Uh, look what Hans Pelzig did. Uh, why would they destroy this building, you know, after the war? Look just at the column. It's, it's, it's an event, an architectural event was because the building does not exist any longer. Uh, a unique interior by any standards. And look, Homo sapiens using the bulldozers to, to bring this masterpiece down. And they did. Unbelievable. In 2005, the Friedrich Stadt uh, Palace unveiled a memorial to Max Reinhardt, Hans Pelzig, and Eric Charles. Char Char designed to represent the imaginary beam of a theater spotlight 
The imposing monument can be seen outside the theater in Friedrich Strasse, uh, but uh, the building is, is gone. The, in Berlin, we are very close to ending this presentation. Bear with me a, little, a few more minutes. Brutalism meets the Baroque, a trio of churches. It's no coincidence that two mid 20th century churches located almost side by side in Berlin Schönberg district look remarkably similar. Both were designed by Hermann Felling and Daniel Gogol. And this is one of them, unafraid to assume modernity, you know, in building churches. And there is another one um, also by them. We are going to see it. There are remarkable churches. There were remarkable churches built by uh, architects uh, whose names we do not know or we do not remember mid-century in the 60s, uh, 50s maybe, 50s, 60s in Germany, really uh, a book has to be published with the sacred architecture, if we are to call it so, uh, built in the mid-century, mid 20th century in Germany, not just in Berlin. And not just in Germany, in Austria as well. Uh, we see the old church on the right, the new church on the left. It's fine. Harmony through contrast. And how hotel? Well, an assertive uh, cantilever to work, unafraid of earthquakes. Why not? Bauhaus archive. also in Berlin, Kino International. This is a work from uh, the former democratic East Berlin, but it's not bad, I would say. I would not demolish it. No, I would not. And now the, the political administrative uh, uh, buildings that were built when Berlin be, became the the capital, uh, I mean, the, the reunited uh, Berlin, East and West. And this is the, you know, in a way, the White House of Berlin. How's their culture and their wealth, the, the house of culture of the world, the culture of the world, also in Berlin. Exhibition Hall of the German Historical Museum by I.M. Pei. Well, I.M. Pei couldn't miss the boat. He had to be present there too with his uh, curved uh, large pieces of glass. And glass means suffocation during the summer and cold during the winter. That is if we still have winters, but with air conditioning, these uh, the small uh, problems uh, might become even smaller. The International Congress Center, a large machinery, uh, you know, a machine for congresses, you know, not for leaving, but for uh, talking, for debating, for congresses, for conferences in Berlin, built, I don't know, in the 70s or so. Chapel of Reconciliation, we are at the very end of the presentation. Here it is a small, uh, or maybe not so small, well, a small, a rather small, medium-sized chapel of reconciliation. And this is the city to have it in, you know, because it was reconciled East Berlin with West Berlin. Velodrome, well, from uh, religion, we go to <laughs> Velos, and this is the Velodrome in, in, in Berlin. And that was it. So thank you for being here until, uh, until now, because it was a rather long presentation.